Welcome to our first broadcast. Uh, this is Rishi Jarvis from astronomy.fm. And uh, with me today, I have uh, some esteemed panelists with me as well. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Padma, Yana Miranda Fisher as well for organizing this hangout. Um, so with me this evening, I have Tony Angel, um, who is uh, based in... Um, in Spain, and he's going to uh, start off this evening with a uh, description of his observatory and also uh, talk to us about comet imaging and uh, calibration of data as well. Then we have uh, Jacob Cherney, who's, I can't remember where you are, Jacob, but uh, he's uh, based somewhere in Europe, um, and he's going to be reporting to us on uh, observations uh, how you uh, report observations to COBS. Um, so basically data modeling of uh, cometary information. And then we've got Emily Law, who's going to be talking to me. Uh, sorry, Emily Law and uh, Sean uh, Malhotra, yeah, um, who is going to be talking to us about, or uh, uh, well, they're going to be talking to us about the creation of 3D visualizations and what information is needed from amateur astronomers to produce 3D images. So we've got a, quite a packed schedule tonight. So thank you very much for all our panelists for joining this evening. Unfortunately, uh, Damien Peach was not able to join us tonight. So uh, uh, apologies for that. Um, so uh, we're going to move to our first panelist, which is uh, Tony Angel. Tony, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about uh, 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 about your observatory location and uh, how you make things work? Right. Okay. Well, first of all, let's get uh, uh, some pictures up. If I can find the right ones. Right. Can can you see the uh, map of Spain? Yes, we can indeed. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, it's all yours. That, Take it away. <laughs> yes, I am in. Yes, I am in Spain, and uh, I'm uh, in the province of Granada, and uh, uh, which is in Andalusia, in uh, southern southern Spain. When the screen comes, when the picture changes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, my observatory is at uh, um, 4,100 feet on the top of uh, Nevis, uh, so that's 1,350 meters. Um, technology is not uh, behaving itself. Ah, here we go back one. You can see two of the observatories. Um, there's there's one on the top of the hill there, which is the one I mainly use. Plus I have uh, two smaller ones uh, down here, just in front of the the house. Right. It's going to have a look at the uh, the telescopes now. Um, I've been here. For 13 years, and it's taken quite a while to build up the observatories. The observ the telescope that's going to be coming up. Ah, here we are. Um, this was the first observatory I built, which is my own, which has got a, a roll-off roof uh, containing a uh, LX uh, uh, 214 inch and a Questar 7 inch. Uh, I have C14 mounted. Then, on top of the uh, what I call observatory hill, I have the uh, uh, a C14 uh, uh, with a full top. Let's see if I've got a larger. If it will show the larger picture, um, I've got a quite a good horizon apart from the north, where I've got the uh, Sierra Nevada behind me. Um, the highest mountain range in Spain. Um, this is the setup of the telescope. I have um, an ST7 uh, uh, on the uh, Pentax 
and a ST8 on the back of the C14. Uh, this is especially useful with comets, because when I'm just doing the very faint ones, then I'll use the C14. Um, but uh, when, when they get in uh, closer in and we get in the nice tails, then I tend to switch over to the, uh, the wide field F4 Pentax. Um, there is another telescope that's going to come online soon. Uh, if my photo viewer behaves itself, it hasn't been up to now. <laughs> um, no, it's not behaving. I've got a twenty. Ah, there we are. Uh, that's a twenty. That's a twenty-four inch f4 um, remote. Con as with the others, it will be able to be controlled from the farmhouse, and uh, it has a field derotivator on it, uh, so that um, although it's an Altas Dobsonian type mount, it will be able to uh, track uh, in, uh, uh, comets and uh, by derotating, um, th that will take care uh, of any distortions. Right, that's, that's that for the moment. Uh, let's uh, switch over to another, another screen. Um, you have to excuse me, it's the first time with this technology and it's going to, it's, uh, ah, here we are. Um, One thing you should be aware of, Tony, is that the pictures were actually coming up for us before they were displaying for you, so we were seeing the picture when you switched to it. Were you? Oh! Right. I could the, te the technology <laughs> was, was working. Oh, it wasn't was updating it. Your end. <laughs> I was obviously looking at the screen. Right. I'll take um, actually doing the observations. Um, I I used the sky. Um, excuse my dog barking in. Um, I I used the, the the sky software, which is uh, quite helpful. Uh, excuse me for a second. Shut that door. Um, I tend I tend to use it with uh, uh, everything switched off apart from deep sky objects and comets. Um, and what I can do is uh, I can uh, pro from here I can control the uh, the observatory. I'm or, unfortunately it's not open yet, it's only just getting uh, dusk, getting to dusk, um, but I can get, I can click on a comet and I can slew directly uh, to it, you can see the everything slewing. And I, I the uh, the object information box to decide how long to actually image because I take lots of relatively short images uh, and then stack them together and one of the things when you, say, you don't when you want say, to do when you say relatively short what sort of length of exposures are we talking about here gone down to two seconds um, but quite uh, can be anywhere between two seconds and a minute, probably averaging somewhere in the 20 seconds, 30, uh, 30 seconds range. It all depends on which telescope I'm using and also um, the, it, it, can you see the cursor here? It's showing the RA rate, the number of arc seconds um, that that comet is moving uh, in relation to the background stars. Oh, excellent. And, yeah, that is useful, yeah. So I, I look at that information. Now, the Pentax um, telescope, that, uh, a pic the pixel size is approximate, approximately um, 4.5 arc seconds. So what I have to make sure is that when I when I take an image using the Pentax, that I don't take an image longer than um, the movement um, of the comet 
in the RA index. And I look at those figures and uh, I can calculate um, normally a rule of, rule of thumb um, on how long I can take an image for. That's why sometimes they are down to quite few, quite low seconds. Recently, um, yeah, so, so you, you, you say you can, you can give a, 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 you know, a guesstimate, a rule of thumb on that. So what's, uh, what, would, what would your calculation be? Okay, I can I can uh, round round it up. I mean that's that's very very that's very low figure. This particular comet I've just brought up. It's uh, uh, point zero, call it zero two um, arc seconds per second. Um, so that would be fifty seconds um, multi uh, multi uh, multiplied by uh, 4.5. So I, in fact, on that one, I could, I could do um, a couple of minutes exposure on that without it uh, moving outside the pixel. Though other factors come in, uh, the, the brightness of the comet. Um, so you, 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 you tend to. What, what I tend to do is um, using the. Uh, uh, the imaging program the uh, um, mm, within the camera control and if it's a comet I've not done recently then I'll experiment a bit on the length of exposure I will never do an exposure longer than the time it will take uh, to cross a pixel um, and then I, I, I will look at the brightness of, of it, so I'll, I'll come down, and quite quite often it's between 30 seconds and a minute um, for, for most comets, but uh, recently with the comet Jackus, um, that was moving very, very fast. I was down to uh, with second um, with that. I was I was down to just and like I said, I take a number of images. I stack them up. Set the uh, how long the exposure is going to be, and how many I want to take. So you, you're actually you're, you're you're basically making sure that you take an exposure length which is appropriate to how quickly the comet's moving, yeah? Yes. Okay. And 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 it's and relation to its brightness as well, because if you've got a very bright comet, then you you you, you can saturate, and you don't want that. Mm. Um, you you want to be able to get it. Down, not to a, obviously not down to a point source, but uh, when you when you're uh, wanting to be able to see um, exactly where it is, uh, the, the astrometry of the comet, um, then you you want to be able to send find find uh, as near to the centre of, of that comet as possible. And if if you take too long an exposure, then you're not going to be able to find that out. Um, so I'll take a, a, a stack of of images. Now these I am I am just taking what's called a light frame. Um, with, with taking imaging, with uh, you, with taking images, you you have got various things going on. You you've got dust and maybe a few splatters of uh, water or something on, on, on the telescope, dust motes on filters, and uh, which all have to be taken off uh, the, the final image. The, um, the thermal noise uh, of the image has to be taken into account. Um, but to do all of those things as you, as you are taking the images, um, reduces the amount of images you can take in a certain 
length of time. So what I tend to do is take a series of light frames and then later on um, most all the all the imaging uh, software has it it enables you to um, to go back later and actually reduce uh, the the images that is to take a, that is to take sub to take out um, uh, any of these dust motes um, uh, to uh, cover the effect of uh, that the the surface of the CCD is not perfect, um, and also the um, you, you get hot spots and uh, various other things. So what you do is separately you take a series of different types of images. You take dark images which capture the currents, the dark the, the currents of the um, of the a camera. You take uh, flat um, flat frames which capture the uh, uh, the imperfections uh, on your telescope and uh, on the front of the CCD, um, and you you then use the program to to apply those against those light frames you've taken. Uh, uh, there isn't time at the moment to go through it, but it'd be, it'd be possible to actually show you the, 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 the difference between a frame that has been taken uh, where there's nothing been done with it. Uh, in fact, there is um, a light frame on there at the moment, um, but unfortunately, I can't see. You can probably see it, but I can't see it because the, this, this, it's not behaving itself very well at this end. But you can we, see... We can see you can yeah, see a light frame, you yes. can you can see on there that um, it's um, it it's not a very clear image. Let's see. I had set it up. I'm, I'm going a little bit blind here, um, but I should be able to reduce this um, this this frame. And what this is doing is applying all of those uh, flats, the bias, the dark frames that I've taken, and hopefully um, it will. Whilst whilst that is doing yeah. that, uh, oh. Nick Powers. Oh, don't no, forget that I pre I press I press the wrong key. I'll reduce it um, again. Uh, um, Nick House has just asked a question. Uh, um, so uh, he asks, why not check? Uh, why not track non-sided? Like the picture. Hello, Hello Tony. You you you're breaking, you're breaking up. Yeah. Hello. 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 So uh, Nick House asked a question in chat. Why not track non-sidereally? That's fine if you if you uh, for certain type of Im imaging, but um, what I want to do is to be able to um, capture uh, literally minute by minute the position of the comet, uh, which you can only which you um, or thirty second by thirty second. You can only do that if you're t if you're doing multiple images. If you are um, taking a um, tracking the comet, uh, which the, the mount I, the mounted software I have allows me to do that. Um, then yes, I'm going to get a very nice uh, picture of the limit, the amount of information that you can get by taking lots of images. You you can gradually stack them up. And see the detail in the tail. Single long exposure of the comet, they're not going to see um, all that information. Nor are you going to be able to do the. Uh, um, uh, you, neither are you going to be able to do the positioning of the comet, uh, the the astrometry. Okay. Um, okay. So that didn't uh, work very well. I don't think. I, ca I can't tell whether it worked. 
whether it worked or or, or did didn't. Uh, it's so, it sort of worked. There's a bit of gradient in there, but it sort of worked. Okay, so um, all right. And then finally, yeah, fi finally the other piece of software which I because I'm not seeing all the screen at the moment, I won't go into it properly. I use a piece of a software called uh, Astrometrica, which is absolutely brilliant. It was originally done um, uh, for, for asteroids, um, but uh, Comet observers use it as well. In fact, I would think 90 odd percent of Comet observers use it. And this uh, can do quite a number of things. It can uh, uh, stack your images. Um, you, it can do the astrometry, and it can also do the photometry. It supports quite a number of uh, the, um, the major catalogs, and is a brilliant piece of software. Um, right, I, I can't. Unfortunately, I, the demonstration I was going to do, I can't do because I can't. I can't see the screen. Um, Oh well, that's, the, that's a shame. Thing, Thank you very, yeah. very much for uh, for showing us that. I mean, uh, what we'll have to do is do a uh, a training session on on Astrometrica another time, I should think. But uh, that that would be. Uh, let's switch this. Is my screen off now? Is it? Uh, no, your screen is still on. So, so I'm uh, switch it off. Is it off now? Right. <laughs> yes, it's off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time, there, Tony. Um, and uh, just a just a reminder that to our uh, that our panelists will be taking questions at the end of the session. So uh, after we've spoken to Jacob and also to uh, to uh, uh, Emily and uh, Sean, uh, yeah. we'll be we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. So if you've got any questions yeah. for Tony that you'd like uh, to ask, um, please. Uh, Please stay on on at the end and uh, uh, put the questions in your um, uh, 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 to yeah. the panel at the end. Okay. One thing, uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention because I was supposed to say a bit about my background. And you've got Paul uh, there in the background. I did before coming here. I spent ten years with the Croydon Astronomical Society, and. Uh, that's where I really got into CCD work. So, uh, hi, Paul. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, now that the data has been taken, so we'll new, move on to the next part of the process. Um, how is it communicated to the community, and what additional modeling can we do with it? Uh, Jacob Cerny uh, uh, is an observer and affiliated with the uh, COBS project. Um, database archive and will help us demystify this process. Jacob, welcome. Uh, again, uh, the analyzing of flight course of very tricky. We need to correct uh, the magnitudes for uh, geocentric distance first to see the uh, real effect of its approaching sun. And uh, we can do a simple uh, magnitude analysis using CEOPS database. Uh, this is what we can see uh, now here on the, uh, on the screen. So first, I selected the time, time frame until this year spring. So we can see that the initial brightening of Comet was uh, with the factor of three is the this this number. Uh, just uh, one note: the factor of four is something like average value for all comets, and the factor of two is like average uh, value for inactive asteroid bodies. So, uh, comet sitting spring initially brightening uh, very slowly, uh, but uh, it was brightening. It, its activity has been increased in previous time. But uh, when we switch to another slide, so so we can analyze uh, previous weeks and months uh, when the mine visibility of this comet started. We can see here on the CEOPS that when we select this spring to uh, actual, actual time, 
and here we can see the observation. Uh, the factor, the brightening factor, has decreased under a value of 1. So this means uh, that uh, this comet is not only uh, not increasing activity very fast, but uh, its activity really decreasing. Uh, the one of the main factors that causing the decreasing of uh, magnitudes or brightness lacking for dynamically new comets, which uh, Sitting Spring uh, to, to which Sitting Spring belongs, uh, is the uh, sublimation from icy grains in coma. Uh, this effect was firstly described for a comet uh, 103 Hartley when there was uh, our spacecraft, and uh, later, if you can remember, comet uh, C 2009 uh, Garat. Uh, then there, there was also observed this uh, this phenomenon, and uh, the sublimation of icy grains uh, is caused uh, by volatiles, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, other gases that are released very far away from sun. They are taking uh, small icy grains with it, so uh, coma of comet is filled with the icy grains, and when it's uh, past the frost line. Icy grains starting to sublimating. So uh, the activity of comet seems to be much higher than the nucleus can can afford. So uh, when the icy grains, uh, the, when the population of icy grains is decreased to near, nearly zero in the comet, then the brightness of comet starts to decline. And this is what we can observe right now here on the gr uh, on the plot. Uh, the green line is for uh, decreasing activity and now the brightness decreasing even much in the uh, past days but this is probably caused just by this effect okay now uh, let's see the let's see other comets here we can see four dynamically new comets uh, when we use the save button on seops analysis page we can we will look on it later and try to make deeper analysis uh, using other software, we can plot the distance corrected magnitudes against uh, logarithm of heliocentric distance. This makes uh, brightening function to be linear, and we can see brightening trends in lines uh, that looks uh, much, much better. So we can see real activity in, and its uh, change in lines. Uh, comparing with other comets, we can see that Sitting Spring have very uh, similar activity and its evolution as, as comet's I-zone. The I-zone on the plot uh, is red and the comet Sitting Spring is black. Uh, probably it may also have uh, one kilometer or even sub-kilometer nucleus, the, but thanks to a large perihelion distance, it should be relatively safe from disintegrating, unlike ISON. Uh, on the plot, we can also see actual comet Panstars, which is green, uh, and uh, comet Okaimeden, which is blue. Uh, it seems that uh, comet Panstars is very, very active and uh, have a probably average or larger nucleus. And uh, all the other three, all other three uh, comets are very small. And comet Ison was disintegrated. Comet Okaimeden uh, is in disintegration risk also. And comet Sitting Spring is only one that's in, in the safe distance from Sun. Okay, let's move to another slide. Okay, this is uh, just easy. Until yesterday, on CEOPS was collected already 101 observation of this comet from seven observers, visually and CCD from whole planet. Uh, when we are going to get enough astrometric data and uh, comet sitting spring non-gravitational non parameters, can be established, we can use CEOPS data to estimate maximal mass of its nucleus and compare it with other in-situ measurements during March approach. So we can plot the comet in the, uh, in the number of comets we can see here. This is already results from the CEOPS and we can see the small dynamically new comets as an I-zone here on the bottom.
Okay, just a few few notes. Uh, I can hear you very well. Can you say again? Could you explain to us how you actually uh, get the, uh, you know, reduce the data down into uh, to actually get this uh, the, the magnitudes? Uh, well, uh, that's uh, that's very very easy to explain. Uh, when we um, make the analysis of light curve, we are getting uh, the absolute magnitude of comet and the brightening speed. And the absolute magnitude of comet, uh, we can it is uh, basically its brightness in one astronomical unit distance from sun. And uh, non-gravitational parameters of uh, of comet that's the deceleration of nucleus in the same distance and uh, absolute magnitude, visual absolute magnitude that we are getting from CEOPS uh, can be transferred to, to the directly to the water production rate and the deceleration is caused by the gas flowing from the nucleus uh, towards sun so uh, when we know the deceleration, when we know, know the mass of the water that uh, are in the jets from nucleus, then we can calculate the mass of uh, remaining body uh, on which is uh, deceleration applied. So this is the this is the mine mine thing we can easily do from the orbital elements that uh, including the non-gravitational parameters and the uh, absolute magnitude obtained from CEOPS database. Uh, to the uh, here we can see the basic amateur contribution that uh, can be used like this. And it's uh, the basic thing, it's the astrometry that uh, also the uh, Tony Angel do. Uh, it's the CEOPS where we can report visual magnitude estimates that are uh, counted to this analysis uh, or CCD photometry or even uh, further it CCD photometry uh, where we can determine the coma color. We, we know that in the uh, we filter it uh, observations uh, there are brightness mainly for the coma uh, co for the gas component and in the red color in air filter we can see the uh, mainly the dust component so when we compare the brightness of dust and gas we can tell how what is the dust to uh, gas ratio of uh, actual comets for uh, comet sitting spring it's uh, not actually good measured right now so we have to wait for a few new data and uh, as I said, air filter data can be used to measure the dust production itself. So that's uh, the IVRO parameter. Okay, so I will try to make it faster because the time is running. And uh, here is one uh, nice thing we can do with the CEOPS. Uh, when we visit the analysis section on the page. Uh, we need to be uh, registered on the page and log it in. Uh, so after that we can go to the analysis section. Uh, in the analysis section, I will show you that later, we can um, select Comet, Sitting Spring, and uh, then uh, we can plot the curve and when we do that on the bottom of the page, uh, there is a link button and when we press the link button there are open it a new page and uh, on that page when we copy copy the it, its link then uh, we can use the link in the iframe to, to be inserted directly in any other web page so if you have your blog or uh, your own web page you can uh, Past this on it in iframe and then you will see uh, its actual evolution real time when you insert the data in the CEOPS database then it will real time show on our page or blog and uh, this is I think the best thing on the CEOPS I will show you uh, some some other basic things very fast uh, so when we are observers and we are registered and we'll get in then here is the observe observation section uh, you got here uh, very long formula that uh, very long form that uh, contain 
all uh, needed data for observation. Uh, but if we use the ICQ data format and, and we have uh, much more data in store, we can add them dir directly using uh, the multiple observation page. So we can just copy paste the data there and, uh, oh, sorry, the bad page was open it, and we can just send all the data together. Uh, when we send the data to the CIOPS database, we can see on the front page recent observations. So here are the recent observations on commas. And when we click on the link, uh, a, pay, a page is opened. And on the page, we can see the last observation for past 30 days. And here is the past observation of, of Comet Seeding Spring for this time frame. So we can see uh, its actual evolution here. And uh, next, next interesting thing is the analysis page I talk about. You can select the comet here or just write here in the window uh, its its destination. So it's easy like this. This press enter, and the plot like this is show up. And when we uh, scroll down the page. Here are all observations. We can save the observations to our computer, and we can make our own analysis, or we can press the link button, and then there are there is open the uh, or, or, or we can here select uh, the analysis features. Then we can see its actual absolute. Up, up, absolute magnitude and the brightening factor. And when we press on the link, then the new page appear. And this page we can insert on our blog or website. OK, this is the, the page. We just uh, need to cop copy the link. And this link in the iframe is, uh, can be inserted everywhere. So <laughs> that's everything from me, I hope. I didn't eat too much time. <laughs> no, that was absolutely fine. And thank you very much for a, a fascinating insight into uh, into comet observations, uh, Jacob. It was uh, really great. Um, now we're going to have a look at our next subject. So we're going to turn over to the realm of 3D images, animations, and visualizations. Um, these help us to uh, make tangible the images of comets that we see. Um, <clears throat> and that's exactly what uh, some of the experts uh, working at JPL specialize in, making 3D maps and surfaces of these objects. We have Dr. Emily Law, who's in charge of the Lunar Mapping Project, um, joining us this evening. Uh, and she oversees a group of creative animators and visualizations. And also with her as well, we have uh, Sean uh, Malhotra. I, I hope I've got your name right there, Sean, um, who is also joining us uh, to talk about uh, comet visualizations and uh, animations. Right, let's just make sure the technology is working. Emily, can you, uh, can you hear me OK? Can you? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Nice okay. to meet you, Emily. And uh, Sean, I believe you're yeah, muted. I, I can hear you as well. Oh, thank you very much for joining us, Sean. Um, so would you just give us a quick introduction to yourselves, and then uh, you can teach us all how to, uh, how to make these comet images we've taken uh, superb. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll first start. Um, thank you for inviting us uh, from JPL to join you. Um, basically, you know, our group um, are very interested in uh, building technologies and capabilities, the tools and systems that will transform observations into two or 3D multiple dimensional objects and then um, provide also capability and system to allow users to be able to uh, visualize those objects. Um, Sean is our, our technologist. Um, he knows all the, the in and outs and how to build, um, uh, uh, transform the, the images into 3D objects and for viewing and um, for you know, enhancing the usability. So he will get into more detail about them. Um, if we have an opportunity, we would like to also show a demo of uh, 
some of the capability we have that showing a 3D uh, the visualization of the Vester uh, oh, body. Oh, yes, please. That would be awesome. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, our our work um, spans on to all the uh, solar systems observations. So we work on Earth, uh, Moon, Mars, and also, you know, different uh, small bodies as well. So I actually don't know how to share my screen to, to do the demo. I, I'm not sure Sh Sean is able to do that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I also have a, a meeting that I need to run to in about 10 minutes. So, so I'll let Sean take over, but uh, I'll be happy to, you know, answer any questions if there's are any right now. And, um, and sorry, I probably wouldn't be, be part of your question and answer session there later. So I, my, my apology ahead of time. Not a problem. Thank you much for uh, spending some of your precious day with us, anyway. Um, and uh, Sean, if you uh, if you if you click on the little screen share icon, um, just in the menu bar, just to your uh, on the left of the screen, you should be able to choose the screen you want to share and and show us what you want to show us. Can you see that? There you go. Oh, yeah, I can wow. see it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Okay, so this is a. What we've, what we've put together here is uh, we have a, a, a public website called lmmp.nasa.gov, and you all can uh, go there and browse uh, images of the moon. Um, most of the images are uh, taken from the LRO spacecraft, but we also have historic images taken from early Apollo as well as from uh, Clementine um, uh, and, and other missions, Lunar Prospector, uh, Selena, and Chandrayaan. Um, what you're looking at here is a uh, 3D rendering of uh, the, the data that came down from the Dawn spacecraft. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've taken that data and built a, a 3D viewer to allow people to browse the data set uh, sort of in their browser. So. What I did was I pointed my browser to a website, and and what I'm going to do is uh, use my mouse to uh, sort of rotate Vesta around and be able to look at this object um, uh, at, uh, from from any perspective. Um, by using uh, two finger scrolling, for example, I can scroll out or scroll in, and so you can look at the data at, at various resolutions as well. So, for example, I can zoom into this crater here, and and you can see uh, these are the these are the highest resolution images that we have of of of, of this object. Wow. There's the uh, the tool also allows you to um, change your uh, perspective. So, for example, right here in the bottom left, uh, right now I have it set on mouse controls. If I switch it to game controls, what I can do is I can use um, I can use the the standard keys that are used by gamers to uh, allow us to uh, sort of change the view like as such and be able to sort of fly along the surface or walk on the surface. So a user can can I'm not very good at gaming, but uh, you can kind of see what it what it looks like by sort of flying around on the surface or, or yeah. You guys can see that okay? Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe they can. I, th I think we had just a little bit of a pause in, in, uh, in, in the display then, but I believe everybody can see that. Yeah, similarly to that <laughs> one, we can go to, um, This is the this is a, a high resolution image of the moon. This is uh, about 12 gigabytes that you're looking at here. Uh, when I flip the the image to uh, 3D view, you can do similar things as I was doing for Vesta. So we we can uh, allow a user to zoom in, browse, and uh, look at the high resolution images of the moon uh, as new data comes down. Uh, from LRO, we load new data into this system and 
Uh, this data includes not only what I'm showing you here, but also uh, chemical constituent maps. Um, we do slope analyses. We do hazard maps, rock detection, um, various uh, crater crater uh, crater counts. Um, various types of analyses can be done on the imagery, um, and really the tools are, are. We're trying to build a common tool that allows us to to um, to view uh, the moon, Mars, and and objects like Vesta uh, using um, using sort of a common framework. So how, do, how does the data actually get into this this tool then? I mean, this is the end result that we're looking at here. So w what do you actually need to get that data into the tool? So basically what we need is uh, the, for, for the view that you're looking at here, there's two main components. One is uh, the actual DEM, the digital elevation map. Um, what we need from that is a... a, um, a a TIFF, a geo TIFF, uh, which describes the height of the terrain at every at, at every pixel. And in addition to that, we need a an imaging layer, something that we can drape on top of the dam in order to uh, show sort of texture. So for for to do to show uh, what I'm showing here, you basically just need those two things: a DEM uh, in geo TIFF format and uh, GeoTIFF is a common format used by GIS uh, uh, scientists uh, throughout the world, uh, as well as um, uh, a GeoTIFF uh, formatted image. If we can get those two pieces of information, we can take that take that data and drape the imagery on top of the, the 3D perspective view to, to be able to do things like I'm showing here. I would like to add that uh, we also uh, need to understand the, the projection system that would be used um, and also the shape file of the, the, uh, the different objects as well. Awesome. Absolutely, uh, absolutely brilliant. I mean, the beautiful images that you're pulling out. So, um, mm. are you going to be using? Uh, are you going to be producing a, a, a similar 3D map of uh, the Rosetta comet, for example? Yes, that's actually something that we had a meeting with uh, some people here locally at JPL regarding that very topic, um, and there are there is now. Uh, uh, sufficient data available to produce uh, t the at least initial versions of, of the Rosetta Comet, yes. So we could go walking on the duck. Th there we go. <laughs> well, brilliant. Thank you very much to uh, Emily and Sean for uh, right. sharing your expertise with us and, uh, 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 and, and Thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening for allowing us, uh, for enabling us to uh, take the processing of our data to the next level. Um, so now we've got the Q&A uh, section of the Hangout. So um, we've had a few questions in already, I know. So uh, let's uh, let's start at the beginning and see. Uh, I, I, what I'd like to do is if if everybody would like to unmute and you can all dive in and and uh, comment on a particular question if you would like. Okay, so if you, uh, uh, panelists, if you click on the Q&A button to the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a list of the questions which have been asked in the, uh, in the Hangout so far. Hi all, this is Emily. Um, I need to uh, check out, so I apologize. Um, so Sean should be there now if there are any questions come up in terms of imaging and 3D you know, capability. Okay? Thanks again for inviting us. Have a good uh, day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Emily. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. And we're also, uh, Padma Yana Miranda Fisher has also joined us as well now as well. So if you have any questions for Padma, please let us know. Uh, I can see one question here from Nick House. Uh, I know that name from somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. Um, says, uh, uh, are the COPS people using the FOCAS or other methods for magnitude calculations? And are you using SDSS or Bessel Johnson filters for the BV and R exposures? Uh, Jacob, I guess that's probably one for your neck of the woods, isn't it? 
Uh, yes, but I don't understand the question uh, right, right right now uh, about the uh, filters. Uh, if you go and have a look at the QA section. Uh, I'm <laughs> trying to open it, but uh, somehow there are, it's empty. I I've, I've put it in the chat room for you. Okay, unfortunately, it looks as though Jacob has left us. Um, <clears throat> okay, another question for Sean. Uh, in the terms of chemical composition mapping, what kind of correlation do you have with lunar meteorites on Earth in terms of precision analysis, or is the spatial and spectral resolution not sufficient? Um, we have not done any correlation with... Uh, um uh, spectral analysis from Earth. Uh, really what we've done is uh, collected uh, data from the various instruments that have orbited the Moon and we've been able to correlate them amongst each other but not compared that to what, what has been done on Earth. Uh, we're, we're currently in the process of attempting a, uh, to get a data set of M cubed data. M cubed the Moon mineralogy mapper instrument from, that flew on the Indian spacecraft Chandrayaan and uh, that that it was a JPL instrument. We're, we currently do not have any m cube data loaded into LMMP but uh, that is something that we're working uh, on and would like to have uh, available and that, that really would provide a new uh, level of spectrometry data um, than we've ever had before. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Jacob uh, has just rejoined us. So, uh, Jacob, uh, c have you seen the question now? Yes, I, I can see it now. Uh, I don't know about the papers using focus uh, for magnitude calculation because the magnitude calculation are mainly done done by uh, the um, by rules of uh, International Comet Quarterly and uh, for me. I'm using uh, Gaia software for uh, aperture magnitudes. I think the focus is allowed by uh, ICQ database right now, so I guess there are some people that are using uh, CIOPS uh, to adding the data from the uh, process uh, from the focus. Uh, about the filters, uh, there are many filters we can use uh, for the problem is that the uh, International Comet Quarterly uh, is down for a few years, uh, but the, so, so the rules are not updated. So yes, uh, right now we are uh, mo most people using uh, Bessel Johnson filters for uh, core filtered uh, photometry, uh, but uh, there are some some new people that are using the Sloan uh, Sloan photometry, uh, the uh, GRI. So uh, that, that's that's for now, but uh, such such methods don't have their ICQ keys, so it's a little problematic. And we are waiting when the International Comet Quarterly gets back up uh, for CIOPS. We are trying to uh, make uh, some new codes, uh, some uh, until the IC International Quarterly will, will will back up, so we can send this data to the CIOPS now and later when ICQ gets up then they can be converted and used for ICQ also. So, uh, yes, that's the answer, I hope. I have a question for Sean, if he's online. I'm here. Oh, hi, Sean. Uh, hey. Sorry about your coming in so late. It's just a, been a hectic day. Uh, mm -hmm. But I Good really am, I really like the uh, uh, image you showed of Vesta. And mm -hmm. I have a question about the um, different data uh, resolutions from different data sets. Mm -hmm. and if you used them 
uh, to put them on the same uh, uh, model. How does that, uh, uh, well, for correlation purposes, not uh, going to be very helpful, but how do you match the resolution, or do you not need to worry about it? No, we actually do need to worry about it. Um, so what we do, what, what the geotiffs give us is a, um, a pixel by pixel uh, representation of uh, where that pixel is in in three space. Um, and when you t when you're comparing data from different instruments, they will definitely have different resolutions. And what we do is we we um, we take the uh, data and we uh, build a tile pyramid, and the tile pyramid allows us to look at the data at various uh, uh, pixel densities. Um, and what we do then is we match the the, um, the the data as well as we can between the two images. So. Um, you may find that when you're correlating low resolution data and high resolution data, you can only correlate them up to the level of the low resolution data. Um, and then uh, the system will, will, will allow you to look at the higher resolution data, but not the correlation will be, um, will be sort of uh, turned off at that point. You can, the system basically lets you correlate up to the level of the imagery. I see. And can you overlay a spectrum on a 2D spectrum on a 2D map? We can. Um, we do that, for example, with uh, like for example, if we went, we have hydro hydrogen concentrations um, on the, on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go into LMMP, pull up a, a hydrogen concentration map, layer it on top of the terrain, and then fly around the surface of the moon and look at the uh, the 3D uh, uh, terrain draped with hydrogen concentration map as your as your texture layer. Hmm. We support uh, 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 including multiple texture layers on top of the um, on top of the surface. I have a couple of videos I can share with everybody, um, and those videos will show you uh, an example of how, of what that looks like. Please, that would be very helpful. Sure. Are they on YouTube? Because if they are, there's a YouTube facility within the uh, within the chat. Uh, they are on. They're currently in um, Google. Um, they're currently under Google Docs, um, under under a Google Drive. But I could upload them to to YouTube. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you know, yeah. If you if you could share your screen and show us them, that would be absolutely awesome. Let me see, let me find one here. Maybe go on to the next question, and then uh, I'll work on that uh, while while we're doing that. Okay, we'll do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we have a, another question. So, uh, Tony, I'm going to fire this one at you. So, uh, just waiting for the questions to come up. Two seconds. Do 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 do. Um, uh, yeah, how are you doing uh, photometry with Astrometrica on a comet as it's a diffuse source? Very, very good question. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits, um, so you said photometry, didn't you, not uh, astrometry. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes, it, it is. How are you doing a photometry with Astrometrica on a comet? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, Tony. All oh, right, yes. Okay. Um, it's very much an area that I'm currently getting into, and uh, Jakob um, uh, was showing uh, some of the tools that, uh, um, that gets that sort of information out, COPS. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm currently working on that. There, there is a you you can get um, a, a rough photometry using Astrometrica, but what you what you do is you use a, a second catalog. Uh, the catalog that you use for uh, astrometry um, isn't very good for 
for photometry, so what you have to do is uh, run it through a second time um, using a, a separate catalog. Um, again, this is one of the benefits of using the, the shorter uh, exposures. Um, when I take an image, even of a fairly bright comet, um, it's actually not taking, uh, it's not covering many pixels. So it is, it is possible uh, to to get a rough idea of, of the photometry using Astrometrica um, with with one of the uh, with one or two of the catalogs. Um, but to fine tune it, then you you need to uh, use some of the tools that uh, Jakob uh, was uh, showing. Okay, can can I say a few words on it? Sorry. Uh, well, the astrometric I have one one big problem. There is uh, unclear uh, which is photometric there, but because uh, it is some automatic process in this software, and uh, when we are making the total comma magnitude, then we are not sure what comma is astrometric I'm measuring, and there is a probably only the bright center. So the results from astrometric can be like a two or three magnitudes uh, different from. Uh, the actual uh, photometry provided by other software. The photometry is mainly the manual work. You can do it automatically for comets uh, by any, um, by, by most of programs, maybe focus, uh, yes, but uh, there are no cir circular apertures as far as I know. And, uh, but the astrometrica uh, has a one, one good advice. Um, you can use astrometrica for stacking images. We are using it many times, so we will uh, we stacking comets in astrometrica and then later stacked images. Uh, we can use for uh, very 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 good photometry in uh, different uh, softwares like uh, Maxim DL in Windows or we using uh, Gaia photometry. Uh, software f un under Linux or Unix. So this is, I think, uh, the best thing the Astrometrica can provide to us. Th this is a very good stacking of uh, comets by their mo motion. That's good to know. Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that, Jacob and uh, and Tony. Uh, right, uh, I've got another question here. Let me just tick that one off. So another question here. Uh, question for Sean: How many layers are there in the, your GIS system? Uh, oh, sorry, how many layers have you implemented in your GIS system? Um, you're talking about hydrogen layers, but how many is multiple? How many layers can you actually um, uh, uh, do you actually have in your in your modeling tool? We have um, up for the moon. We have over 500 um, layers, and uh, some of them are are global. Some of them are regional. Some of them are for very specific craters. So it really depends on what part of the moon you're looking at. The 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 uh, constellation program from NASA had um, defined 50 sites of interest of scientific interest on the moon's surface. And so what we have is detailed. We have 50 sites detailed uh, pretty well, uh, as well as can be done. Um, and for, for so for those sites, we have many layers, including the ones I described: rocks, craters, hazards, slopes, um, chemical constituents, etc. And a user can go into LMMP and load those layers and view them. Um, there's not a limit to the number of layers that you can add, um, although it gets very confusing if you add too many. So it's it's really a human it's a human limitation rather than a software limitation. Cool. Thank you very much, Sean. And it looks as though you've got your your lovely videos queued up yeah. there as well. I do. do so I'll I'll hit play on this one. And so what we're showing here is a path along the moon's surface. Um, the path is defined. Uh, a user types in a a starting point and an ending point, and they say, "I want to traverse this terrain." And so that what this video is 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 a an attempt to, to find a solution to how to get from point A to point B uh, following a terrain. The vehicle in this case has a limitation of not being able to go above a five degree slope. And so the, and you can see here we've turned on a layer. 
Uh, so the the color texture that was just there for that a couple frames. Here we've turned on another layer. So we're we're draping that layer on top of the on top of the texture, so people can see the the form of the terrain as well as the 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 color coatings that have been associated with a particular type of layer. So in this case, you can see we're turning on slope. Uh, uh, or, or we've also turned on uh, rock abundance and uh, as well as a color hill shade in this case. So this is kind of different ways you can view the lunar surface and look at different layers as you as, as you tra traverse the terrain. Oh, that that particular beautiful. video is taken from a place called King's Crater. So nobody's ever been here. No one's ever had this view. Of King's Crater, but it by uh, doing some trickery, uh, orbital imagery is 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 uh, reprojected into a form such that it looks like we just drove along this crater rim. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let's go to the next question now. So I'm going to uh, open this up to the panel. So in terms of activity as a function of distance, is there any correlation with the known frag fragmentation events uh, and these plots? Uh, Jacob, I guess that's for you. Yes, I'm preparing uh, an part of my slide to it. Uh, OK. I'm not sure. Uh, OK. Can you see the slide? Yes, I can see Siding Spring Survival Prospect. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's it. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, this plot is uh, it's, it's uh, the absolute magnetic plot, and we can imagine this uh, as a there, there exists a fun function that uh, oh shit it's it's moved away. Hold on, moment. So uh, there was a very deep analysis in the uh, 90s by John Bartle, which uh, was inspecting nearly 70 comets. And uh, 16 of them was disintegrating. And he found a border that's uh, called, called Bartle survival limit. You can see the line here. And it's a very, very easy equation that's uh, based on the comet absolute magnitude and its perihelion distance. And, and you can see that the, for actual comets, it works very well. The comet I zone is uh, below the line. So by uh, definition of border survival limit, uh, you can see that the comet is actually dis disintegrated, and it, it did. But uh, in the previous years, we can see some other comets that uh, were uh, disintegrated and there were above this line so uh, under it it works perfectly and up that uh, we can see some new sort of objects that are uh, that uh, are ge getting out of the bottle definition but uh, bottle mainly made this uh, equation for comets with very small perihelion distance on. so like, like here but uh, we can see that there, there are some some comets that are um, brighter and this and my my theory about this is uh, very easy um, in the 90s they were observing only the brighter comets and uh, now we can see much smaller comets and we can see them during the disintegration process already uh, okay their, their nucleoses are uh, fine but uh, they are very small so they are sublimating very fast and the brightness of comets getting uh, uh, much faster uh, up and we can see this comet uh, for a few weeks or months uh, very bright and nearly bright as uh, some very calm larger comets so uh, we can see them on the plot above the line but their real activity is under the line and we uh, had to have to catch, catch these comets uh, before their disintegration starting so this line are probably uh, discovered during their disintegration. So yes, there exists some some equations update. No days comet and 
the pre pre comets in previous years. So the, uh, now there is a comet Okaimeden that you can see it here, and uh, we think that this is the case of the comet that can that, that's, that's in the border. And there's, we have found uh, under which uh, there's a high probability that comet can disintegrate. So uh, we are waiting what comet okay Madden will do and if it'll, it will disintegrate we will uh, have things more clearly. <laughs> awesome, thank you Jacob. Thank you Jacob. Um, okay, another question from uh, Mr. Howes again. So uh, for Sean, can you do path for the Apollo landings using the telemetry from those to simulate landing down to a few me uh, megapixels? So can you actually simulate the moon landings now? You can you actually can. Um I actually if you if you Google um Neil Armstrong narrates moon landing, there's a good YouTube video of actually Neil Armstrong uh doing a side by side view of what he was looking at when he was landing on the moon's surface with uh LRO imagery. In, in the pain uh, in in the secondary pain, so he he does a it's like a five minute video, uh, and it, he does a great job of kind of comparing what he was seeing out the window with the latest uh, lunar imagery from LRO. Oh sweet! Uh, uh, can yeah, you can definitely. you just uh, I'm just going to try and find that. Can you just say that again or type it sure. into? Uh, just type um, Neil Armstrong narrates Moon uh, Apollo 11 landing. I'll see if we can Highly pull that up. We can... It's neat to hear his voice. Um, <laughs> well, if we've got uh, at the end, we might just uh, we might just play that at the end of this. Uh, it's a really oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think we I, I think we might just play that at the end as a, as a finish off to because that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <It's>... so um, <clears throat> go ahead. So this is a question. This is a question for Sean as well as uh, Tony and Jacob. Um, now, I I followed as much as I can because I came in a bit late. But how do we uh, or what state of the data should we have calibrated or just uh, sky subtracted data that we can try to do any of these kind of uh, 3D mappings? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, it might take a, a couple of meetings for us to get into the details of, of doing that. Um, but I think that's possible. Given we until about a month ago, we had never attempted doing uh, any objects, and we we our first attempt was Vesta. So what that the what I showed earlier was was our um, uh, sort of foray in, into into mapping objects that have strange shapes. Uh, the Moon and Mars are are very spherical, and so the cartographic mapping is is quite uh, has been done for many years. For objects like uh, comets or uh, sighting spring or or the Vesta, the CG comet, um, those are um, uh, much more difficult to render we, using standard GIS tools. Uh, so it'd be, I think it would be an interesting exercise to, to, to try to do that, um, mm -hmm. sitting down with somebody that has has that data and uh, uh, attempting to uh, uh, build something like what we showed for Vesta but for other objects. Okay, um, but do you need the data in at least a calibrated form or you just I mean, I, do, I know you mentioned a geotiff, which is a two-dimensional mapping. So, right. how could we, how would we do that with our uh, comet maps, which are they're two D images, but they're not literally in a geotiff format? So, what's the closest format that we can give you? Well, I think if well, we, from a, from an image, what we need to know is 
uh, for each pixel, what is its position? Um, so when we take an image from a from a telescope, we we don't have that information. What we'll have to do is come up with a an attempt to guess um, that uh, so that if we can uh, sort of take the take the raw data and 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 derive a, sort of a mapping file to allow us to build the geotiff, then you can use our tools after we go through that process. Okay. I don't know for for the comets what has been done yet. Um, I believe for the e for the for Rosetta they've they've started to do that. Right. Well with Rosetta if you're using the images from Rosetta uh, cameras, they're basically modeling the nucleus, so it's not taking into account the coma, which is what we see from Earth. We only right. see the coma, we don't see the nucleus. I'm curious if, uh, supposing we were to take a comet image and project it onto the celestial sphere, would we be able to do a geotiff of that as part of the map and use that? Hmm. The co the comets are uh, so we'd, what we'd have to do is we we'd have to understand the. Uh, the the rotation of the comet, um, and so the the images would have to be taken over a series of uh, uh, time in order to um, to sort of derive its its w w the DEM from mm -hmm. from the imagery. Um, it might be what we, we need to do is uh, have somebody send us a data set that they've collected for one of these objects and have us take a look at it and see what possibly can be done. Okay, and how far should the time steps be? I think that will depend on the uh, resolution, the rotation, the it'll depend on a lot of parameters. Um, okay. Maybe we can pick some object that where where that would might be easier to do something that's that's closer to us and and has some three D structure uh, in order for us to see what can be done just to serve as an experiment. Okay, well I guess we can do that when I come back. Um, it's going to be yeah. standard day. If you uh, have some data that's that's of that form, we can take a look at it and see uh, what's possible. Right. I, a lot of our members have submitted a lot of data, so I can, uh, you know, we, we collated it in an album, so I can mm -hmm. show it to you, or we can contact the members themselves. Um, if any of the members listening uh, have a data set that they are willing to share, uh, you know, we'd be very happy to try this out, and t we can all learn from it. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's just uh, one final question here now from uh, a certain Mr. Howes again. Uh, what was the Bortle analysis for 168P Hergen Rover? Anybody answer that one? Okay, I will take that. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, with the periodic comets, as uh, Comet Hergen Rover was, there is a uh, uh, very very large problem because uh, the Bortle formula is not working for periodical comets. Uh, periodical comets itself are uh, very tricky because their nucleus are mostly very large and exhausted for uh, ice and uh, gases, so they are uh, much less active and uh, but they are they are large, so they are far away from disintegration. When when we plot the periodic comets, there are many many comets under the Bortle survival limit that uh, should uh, fragmentation, but they are not. They are uh, so Bortle formula can be used only for long periodic comets and the dynamically new comets from Oort cloud. Uh, about uh, there's another thing about the fragmentation. Uh, Bortle formula talks about the uh, destructive fr fragmentation after which uh, most of the new close is fragmented to the uh, smaller fragments but uh, there is another fragmentation that uh, doesn't affect the affect the nucleus 
much when there are some smaller fragments uh, will this uh, will separate from a mine nucleus so we can observe this many times and this process is mostly very chaotic one because uh, it's uh, almost unpredictable when this will happen there are many uh, many things uh, that we need to uh, think about it's uh, the rotational period if, if the nucleus rotates very fast there is very very large uh, chance that there is there can um, some small fragments separate from from it uh, also there is a accumulating of uh, heat in nucleus when there is not enough water then the uh, heat is accumulating the gases are not taking away the heat from it and uh, heat stress uh, can cause the uh, distortion of uh, surface then some smaller pieces can can be released and uh, other are the tidal forces so when it will approach close to sun or some planet then there can be caused uh, some some other disintegration also which what we don't know is the cohesive strength of cometary nucleus it's very low we know but we don't know how, how much uh, it is and uh, for many different comets we received uh, very very different values so uh, we can uh, sometimes uh, make a prediction of uh, of a dramatic uh, fragmentation that leads to the this total disintegration of nucleus at the end but uh, for uh, releasing small parts of nucleus uh, that's absolutely chaotic process we can can predict unless uh, we having a, a Rosetta near the comet which can see it. So that's my answer. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Nick did, did just say uh, follow up answer uh, or follow up question. Surely, uh, with 67p, this will be easy because you have precise telemetry with Rosetta, etc., uh, uh, and can spill, uh, can build the geotiff. So, I get, uh, it's kind of going back to what we were saying earlier on, Sean, about uh, about building a map of Rosetta. Um, so, I guess that's a, that's the sort of thing that uh, we can hope to be coming out soon. I think so. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so. Thank you very, very much for uh, all of our panelists for sharing their expertise with us. Um, I uh, would just like to go around the whole of the uh, all of our panelists uh, and just say thank you very much to you all and uh, just let you say a final few words. So we'll start with Jacob. So is there anything you'd like to finish off with, Jacob? Uh, well, uh, I, I can make one big call. I think that everyone not, uh, sh should not uh, forget the comet Okai Meden, which uh, can uh, they undertake the disintegration process. So we need to uh, make images uh, very, very often, uh, every day, and uh, to to make if, if such thing will happen, we need to catch the exact moment, and then we can know much more about its uh, nucleus cohesive strength, uh, its uh, dimensions, its size, and it can make uh, our knowledge about the uh, dynamically new comets uh, more, more and more. So I think this is my <laughs> my final word. So thank you much for the time you gave me, and uh, see you later. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jacob. Tony? Hi. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me on here. I would say that, uh, for me, comets are the most interesting objects to observe. It involves quite a long learning curve. There's lots of tools to learn and probably more steps to go through than any other object that you might want to observe and uh, so I'm part way up there and uh, when I hear people like my Jakob I, it tells me how much further that all of us can go so thank you all very much indeed thank you Tony and John 
Yeah, not much to add. It was fun, uh, fun day. Um, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, uh, if anyone wants further information, it's lmmp.nasa.gov, and uh, you can let us know uh, what you think. Let us uh, see, provide us new data, and we'll see what we can do with it. Awesome. Okay, so uh, uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to uh, Paul Harper and uh, Padma Yana Miranda Fisher uh, for helping out with this uh, uh, the, the, this hangout. And